Hello and welcome to News Buyer. I'm Aiza Umar. The U.S. President, Donald Trump, he's warned Iran that it better be careful after Tehran announced it would begin enriching uranium beyond the agreed limits set in the JCPOA, an international nuclear accord signed between Iran and U.S., France, U.K., Germany, China and Russia. Now, this statement from the U.S. president came on Sunday when Iran declared it was hours away from surpassing the 3.67% enrichment limit on its uranium stockpile. Enriched uranium is used for the manufacture of nuclear weapons. President Trump had unilaterally withdrawn from the Obama administration made deal last year and imposed sanctions on Iran over allegations that it, Tehran was violating its terms. Now, this was done despite the UN watchdog, the International Atomic Energy Commission's repeated assurances that Iran was meeting all terms and conditions of not pursuing the manufacture of nuclear weapons. Now, tensions have also escalated between Europe and Iran as after an Iranian oil tanker was seized by the British Marines of Gibraltar apparently on orders of the U.S. So what is the next move for Iran, for the U.S. and now also Europe? Is there any chance of tensions simmering down or are things getting markably worse? So let's introduce our guest who will be speaking to us from Washington, D.C. We are joined by Professor Herbert Regenbogen, who is also a professor, besides being an analyst, uh, at the Institute of Policy Research at the Catholic University of America and the co-chair for the new security architecture. And from Tehran, we are joined by analyst Mr. Mustafa Khush uh, Thank you so much uh, for speaking with us. I'll start with you, Professor Herbert. The situation right now, do you feel that uh, from, from what has happened in the past few days, is there an opportunity still here that either party, whether it's Iran, Europe, or the U.S. could take advantage of, or is this a gone deal? We are on the brink of war, but I do believe, believe that a policy needs to be generated that is shared by both Iran, the United States, and the other signatories to the JCPOA. There is issues that were not included in that agreement, and this is unfortunately a part of the failure of this American uh, agreement with the JCPOA. And mm -hmm. the reset would need to be something that jointly brings about a nature of a new security architecture for the region, for Iran, for the USA, and explicitly protect Israel as an ally of the USA mm -hmm. and gives the respect and integrity and sovereignty recognition to Iran. Okay. So, Professor, just trying to expand a little on something you said here, that uh, the problem with the JCPOA uh, was the deal in itself, the clauses in itself. Do you feel that the Trump administration, uh, if wanted to address those, could have done so differently and, and we would not be here at the standoff? Yes. Could you expand a little on how they could have approached this differently? What would have been those clauses that they wanted to add? Well, I, I, the two major points would be, one, that the missile um, deployment to Hezbollah and respectfully to other proxies in Syria uh, would not be uh, deployed and used against Israel. The second issue would be that the uh, National Guard and its impact uh, of or and other uh, agents of the uh, Iranian um, government would not be involved in um, areas that are considered destabilizing to the interests of the United States and its allies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those two points. Those two points, I think, would be major issues that should be part or would be the part of the of the central uh, central part of such a discussion. Okay. So let me reason. bring you here, uh, bring you in, Mr. Mustafa, in this conversation here. So from what I guess Professor Herbert is saying here, these two, the proxy wars, the long-range missiles, the protection of Israel as, as its allies, those were the mo main issues that seems to have, seem to be missing in the JCPOA that President Trump essentially had a problem with. Now, the, the whole debate spiraled out of control, the situation spiraled out of control on the basis of Iran developing nuclear weapons. 
Do you agree with uh, Professor Herbert's approach to this, that it was not just the nuclear weapons? Well, hello, and thanks for having me. Uh, you know that uh, I have your uh, voice and your other guests' voice uh, uh, not uh, pretty well. I mean, the quality is poor, but... Uh, from what I heard uh, uh, about uh, your uh, American guests' uh, statements, I need to say that, you know, first of all, Iran uh, uh, has been in full compliance with the JCPOA. If Americans or others had any doubt about Iran's true intention with regard to its civilian nuclear program, after two NIE reports at the time of Bush and Obama both, uh, underlined that Iran has not been deviated uh, uh, towards any military goal in its nuclear program. And after the IAEA verified that Iran is in compliance with, uh, standard, with the standards of uh, the watchdog, and uh, uh, after Iran and IAEA resolved all the, the dif their differences on the eve of uh, the JCPOA, the endorsement of the JCPOA, uh, everybody should be thankful to the JCPOA and to Iran's full compliance. If they had any doubt about Iran's true objectives in its nuclear program, they should have tried hard to keep this uh, nuclear deal. There was a class in Washington uh, all throughout the last two decades who believed that Iran and the U.S. could build a partnership or they could at least come to a, some kind of compromise over the regional uh, power equations. And, Mr. Mustafa, uh, Mr. Mustafa, let me interrupt you here and ask you this question. Mr. Mustafa, if the question, you're, what you're basically saying is it wasn't the nuclear problem, it was uh, the other issues, and if Trump had approached this uh, without compromising the nuclear deal, the JCPOA, then... Uh, do you, are you suggesting that Iran would have come to the table to talk about and fairly uh, about the sanctions, uh, sorry, about the missiles and the proxy wars and the protection of its ally Israel? No, I was, no, no, no. I was explaining the same thing. You know, uh, the nuclear deal uh, uh, was struck because there was a class, a class in Washington at the time of Obama who believed that Iran and the U.S. could, you know, work uh, uh, some kind of a deal or reach compromise. But uh, this nuclear deal was supposed to be a win-win deal in nature. Uh, now, Iran is in full compliance while the U.S. has defied all its undertakings and abrogated the nuclear deal. Because Donald Trump is looking for a zero-sum game, a win-lose game, and he is not at all interested in any kind of, you know, uh, true and genuine deal. So Iran may not accept anything like that. Uh, when once Iran gave it a try, and now we can see the situation is like Iran is losing, and Americans, Europeans are just enjoying the merits of the nuclear deal. This is not going to last because if it's going to continue, then all Iranian power components will be contained through similar deals. What mm -hmm. they want is not partnership or or a fair deal. What okay. they want is Iran containment. The United States uh, 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 engagement strategy towards Iran has always been after, in, uh, after containment, not after conflict resolution. Okay, so conflict resolution is not the approach here. Trump wants a zero-sum game. Well, this was not a win-win situation to begin with when he approached the JCPOA. Professor Herbert, how do you respond to this, to what Mr. Musk is saying? People make mistakes. And especially when they don't have the type of leadership and background currently in the administration. But that being said, uh, it, an agreement of one type, like the JCPOA, should not exclude the other security issues. Because we're talking about security, international security. And that is exactly what had not been addressed completely in that agreement uh, between Iran and the United States at the time of the Obama administration. There is hope and there is dialogue. But at the time that this JCPOA was to be a watershed, it did not. All of those issues continued, and they threatened allies and destabilization from the allies, from the U.S. and the allies' perception. But the here's the problem, Professor. 
when the issue here is, as you've, uh, lined, you've uh, underlined for us, the proxy wars and the threat to its inter US interests and its allies, that would have been a conversation that could have taken up. And I get it when you say that people make mistakes. But this is not just one mistake. This is the continuation of a policy by the Trump administration by imposing sanctions after sanctions, trying to corner Iran while at the same time giving absolutely no flexibility, try to punish it for something that it did not violate in the first place, which is the JCPOA. So how does this approach help? And I want to bring here the real threat that we're facing from Israel based on the Begin doctrine, because let's face it, they have declared it very openly that we have preemptive right to self-defense. We have the right to preemptive self-defense. And Prime Minister Netanyahu has come out and already said that what is the UN doing? What, is, what are the co-signatories of this deal doing? They're not making any difference. You're right. There are too many people with too many different objectives. First of all, from the neocons in the administration with regime change in Iran, to the preemptive strike, to the Iranian uh, having uh, felt that this agreement had been uh, dishonestly uh, 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 ended. All of these issues have their uh, validity. But the, the problem is we don't want to have a, a war. At least is that the objective? And one step back, reset, find some commonalities here that will de-escalate the tension. And that is the part of diplomacy and that is the part of leadership. The only other issue here is while your approach is very pragmatic and one would only hope that someone in the Trump administration was listening in at the moment, the thing is that for diplomacy to work, both sides need to give a little bit of leeway to the other. It doesn't seem to be happening this way at all. Do you see any hope that maybe President Trump is going to back off a little on the sanctions to give some breathing space to have this conversation with Iran? I think, I think that uh, President Trump's uh, uh, policy is disruption first and then sit down and make a deal. I don't believe that's really what diplomacy should be about, but mm -hmm. that is his uh, art of policy making. Okay. Based upon so, what? Okay, so Mr. Mustafa, what's your take on it? Do you have any peer, considering that Iran is time and again come out and said recently that we are not going to be coming to the negotiating table? They're not interested. While both U.S. and Iran are not interested in war, there's another very obvious problem here. There's Israel, and we've heard Prime Minister Netanyahu, as I just quoted him. What kind of concerns are there right now in Iran regarding the possibility that they could raise their right to self-defense? Well, uh, first of all, let's remember that the United States has never been after negotiation and genuine, true diplomacy with Iran, uh, especially under Donald Trump administration. Remember that we had uh, some partial deals with the U.S. at the time of Afghanistan invasion back in 2001. And they appreciated our cooperation, but in return, George W. Bush put the name of Iran in the axis of evil. And then uh, there have been similar cases all throughout the last two decades. Now, we all know that Donald Trump is not looking for diplomacy. What he wants is Iran surrender. Uh, we know that international cooperation and collaboration and treaties under treaties help uh, 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 increase and enhance security and stability in the world. And Donald Trump and the United States, they have, uh, you know, abrogated not just uh, the JCPOA, but also Paris Climate Accord, NAFTA, and many other, uh, you know, uh, uh, membership in uh, UNESCO and many other, you know, deals. We, uh, this shows that the United States is just uh, uh, continuing what once Obama said, exceptionalism. Uh, now they call it America first strategy. They don't care about others. What Donald Trump wants is Iran surrender. Well, the strategy would obviously be based on the intention of what they are seeking in the first place. And here, thank you, Mr. Mustafa, for your insight there. But I'd also like to welcome another guest who's just joining us, an analyst from Tehran, Mr. Tare Siddiqui. Thank you so much 
for joining us here on Newswire. We're talking about uh, the dis discussion essentially is right now about whether President Trump's approach of diplomacy, that is disruption first, trying to corner the opponent and then come to the negotiating table, has, let's not talk about has this worked or not, is this going to work in the current situation? Well, I hope and I think it will not happen because Iran has shown every um, diplomatic and in a goodwill gesture that it had uh, been able to uh, demonstrate without receiving anything from the other signatories of the deal. Iran has been acting exactly based on the JCPOA, even when it gave a 60-day optimism to the European partners of the deal. Uh, and nothing has happened. Like, Iran... Um, based on the deal, based on the UN uh, Security Council Resolution 2231, has mm -hmm. every right to stop implementing uh, and performing commitments uh, as defined by the JCPOA at this point because nothing has happened from the other side. This is why the U.S. has illegally and unilaterally um, has withdrawn from uh, the deal. So mm -hmm. um, there is no guarantee that if any negotiations uh, would happen again, uh, the same thing, the same processes um, would not happen. There right. is no guarantee for Iran to go back to the negotiation table and benefit from uh, the... So there's a the huge trust deficit. Mr. Thare, what I understand you're saying is there's a huge trust deficit here. Professor Herbert, I'd like you to, uh, to get your take this about the trust deficit. Seems like a very valid point here, of course that if it had been obliged, it, since it's been obliging to the JCPOA uh, conditions, <clears throat> and it still has to face these sanctions, what is the guarantee that even if it does come to the table and see eye to eye on the issues that the U.S. Uh, the administration right now has in terms of its allies and the, the stability of the region, what guarantees are there? Point one, Iran declares that it will no longer advocate the destruction of the state of Israel. Point two, the United States will hold a moratorium for six months to discuss and negotiate these two issues. Three, the National Guard of Iran will be suspended in its activities on the Arabic Peninsula. Four, it will contain all military delivery of, un, uh, except with the exception of humanitarian aid, to Hezbollah or any other proxies. The United States will, together with the Europeans and with China and Russia, sit together to renegotiate a universal security umbrella architecture. This needs to be done. We can talk endlessly about what the United States does or not do. We are on the brink of war. We need to reset and we need to find a new umbrella of issues that we commonly agree can be contained and respect each other's sovereignty and integrity. Okay. Mr. Tare, would you like to respond to these conditions, these four or five points that Professor Herbert has stipulated would help uh, bringing escalations down? Uh, if, if I've heard your other uh, yes uh, properly, well, I think, first of all, the JCPOA was not intended to curb Iran's influence uh, and really, and even if that's a concern. Uh, second of all, we have to see um, or at least compare Iran's activities in the region with other uh, regimes in the region, including Saudi Arabia. Iran had been uh, present, for example, in Syria upon the invitation of the uh, legitimate gov government that was ruling in Syria. Iran had never, ever supported any terrorists, any um, proxies with aggressive behavior. Iran's support for Hezbollah uh, has been um, based on um, any logical uh, diplomatic uh, relationships. Hezbollah is um, well-known and is supported by the Lebanese people. And um, Iran's support for this political party um, is backed by reason and diplomacy. Mm -hmm. So even if um, the U.S. and other partners want to discuss Iran's influence in the region, they have to have legitimate uh, excuses, legitimate um, reasons to complain about that.
So you're, you're saying that the, the US the, US you're saying the European threat that the U.S. feels in the region for its interests and its allies that uh, the uh, the possibility of its proxy wars that Iran is funding terrorists in the region that that's not a legitimate reason. Well, there is no um, there is no evidence that Iran is um, supporting. Okay. Military adventurism, supporting of uh, terrorism in the region. I mean, the groups that Iran has been supporting are popular uh, resistance groups in the region. I mean, how do you call them terrorists? It's only because the U.S. has called them terrorists doesn't mean that they are really terrorists. If, uh, the U.S. supports the MEK, which are known for being a terrorist group, and does not consider them uh, a terrorist group. So. The, the, the mere act of labeling these groups as terrorist groups is uh, baseless. It, there is okay. no there is no uh, evidence behind this uh, labeling. It, it okay. is aimed at uh, curbing Iran's uh, regional growing influence among uh, the Middle Eastern nations. Mm -hmm. The U.S. is losing its popularity among. Uh, um, Middle Eastern nations, especially after Trump took uh, to the office. Mm -hmm. So, okay. I get what you're saying here. Thank you so much, Mr. Sadeh Siddiqui, for joining us. Back to you, Professor. Let me just add in one more thing here. Uh, there's, of course, an issue, an ongoing debate on semantics and proof of what is a militant organization, what is a terrorist organization, what is a resistant fighter uh, fighting for the rights of the people, the, those who have been compromised in a war fought by completely different regional actors other than the place that they're living in. But there's also one question of diplomacy here, that if these were the stipulations of the Trump administration to get Iran on the table, would there be any guarantee that Israel wouldn't take its, uh, would, would not take advantage of what it's uh, calling a preemptive doctrine, that it would not uh, use uh, as a threat to take anticipatory or preemptive action in case it saw that there was a threat uh, from Iran's nuclear program that it uh, is now currently enriching uranium and so is like in, in part of developing? If, if it's monitored and transparent, as we are now seeing that... Which it was, a, to be fair. The exactly, UN watchdog was, was monitoring and continuously saying that there was absolutely no threat of them developing nuclear weapons. But as you highlighted, the issue was never about the nuclear weapons. The issue was about the proxy wars, the dominance in the region, correct? Correct. And there's no breach of that contract from the, from, on the part of Iran as far as the contract is concerned. Uh, that, and, and, and we can, we can criticize the United States as much as we want about on this point. But the issue is now we are standing at, in a time of uh, ultimate uh, war, we're on this brink. We saw it uh, some days ago. Mm -hmm. And so the issue is what one freedom fighter is to one country is a terrorist to another. And we can debate this endlessly. And we need to come down to some very pragmatic uh, parameters of in the negotiation to de-escalate these kind of issues that are threatening uh, allies. In the case of containing any policy or decision on the part of Israel. I'd like to remind that America's Jewish um, diaspora or Jewish community have a very strong um, influence even on this administration. Uh, the American Jewish community very strong influence on what? On the Trump administration. And if, if for whatever reason something should violate, uh, as, 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 as what we are discussing here, okay. an aggression on the part of Israel without really justifi justification, I don't think that's going to happen. Okay. There's here, let's welcome... Right. Sorry, Professor, let me, we're running out of time. Let me welcome another guest who's just joining us. Professor Fouad is a professor of political communication in Tehran University. Professor Fouad, what we're essentially talking about, let me just give you a synopsis of what we've established so far. The only victim right now of the escalations between U.S. and Iran is the JCPOA. Effectively, something that was being followed to the T has gone out the window. What we're seeing here is a actual 
tension developing over the basis of Iran funding terrorists in the region and U.S. seeing Israel being threatened as a result. How can tensions be brought down here without any kind of guarantees and especially in a scenario where it seems like Prime Minister Netanyahu is also getting ready to defend Israel from a, a possible nuclear Iran? Yes, uh, Israel should be worried about Iran, uh, especially if they uh, attack Iran militarily. Uh, as you saw, uh, Iran's military capabilities are quite extensive. Uh, the fact that uh, the most sophisticated drone in U.S. military can be shot down by Iranian uh, missiles uh, is just a, a tip of the iceberg of what Iran can do to countries that are planning to harm Iran. And... Uh, the reality is that U.S. foreign policy with regard to Iran has not really worked out. They wanted to overthrow the Iranian government in uh, like 1953. They have failed. They wanted to get more concessions out of Iran on its missile program or its regional influence. They have failed. They are also delivering the concessions. So what, that, Professor uh, Fouad, what is the way forward from here? The way forward is realizing all these failures and changing policy. And uh, obviously, you may say that President Trump is not capable mentally to change course, but uh, that is his problem, not Iran's problem. He well, how would, he, that, how would the Trump administration be successful in changing policy, as you say? What would those recommendations be? Go, go back to the nuclear agreement. Stop, it's not about uh, the nuclear the, agreement. That's one thing we know for a fact. And with the development of these events, the tanker, oil tanker being seized uh, by British Marines, uh, supposedly on the orders of the U.S., I mean, this is, the JCPOA was never violated. And that's not one party that's saying it. It's analysts from around the world, critics around the world who have said it. The question really is the dominance in the region. Who holds the guns here? Israel feels a real threat from Iran. Is that a conversation Iran is ready to take on for what it's worth to bring down escalations? Uh, Iran is not interested in a military confrontation with anyone. Iran is not interested in escalating anything. The problem is that the U.S. government has been poking Iran for the last two years, at least. They uh, put Iran's uh, armed forces under sanction. They put uh, Iran's ordinary citizens under sanction. They uh, put Iran's leader under sanction. They don't uh, want Iran to sell oil. They uh, don't want Iran to trade internationally. They want to sanction Iran's uh, banking transactions. When you poke and poke and poke, at the end of that process, you may get a bloody nose, and that's what they're getting from you. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Izzadi, there joining us from Tehran. And we've unfortunately run out. Professor Herbert, thank you so much for joining us on Newswire, giving us your insight. We've come to the point where we will take a quick short break after this conversation while we were trying to wrap our heads around what really is the issue here? How far is it on the U.S. and now Israel going to go? When does the EU or the U.N. step in to bring a stop to tensions that are quickly spiraling out of control? But right now, a quick short break. We'll be back with our second story. Welcome back. You're watching Newswire with me, Aiza Umar. We talked about U.S.-Iran tensions, and now we'll be talking about what's going on in Afghanistan in terms of the high-profile summit, which is taking place between Afghan leaders and Taliban representatives, which was also overshadowed by a huge, huge car bomb in Ghazni in Afghanistan that killed at least 14 people on Sunday. The Taliban, who have taken responsibility for the killing, have also shown some confusion on whether this was carried out by their own. Sohail Shaheen, the Taliban spokesman, while speaking to an Afghan news channel, said that this will be investigated and those responsible for it will be taken to task. Whether this is just political maneuvering or this was actually has actually caught them off guard is something to be seen. Now, the bombing took place close to the National Directorate of Security in Ghazni, the office of Afghanistan's main intelligence service. Meanwhile, in Doha, the two-day summit is still underway. It has been sponsored by Qatar and Germany and started early on Sunday. It is being attended by a delegation of about 50 high-profile Afghan citizens and 17 representatives of the Taliban. We will be talking to our guests about the perspective of peace 
how the negotiation with the Taliban and Afghan government representatives can be expected to turn out. So with that, uh, I would like to welcome our guest who has joined us from uh, Kabul, Mr. Intizar Khadim, an analyst, will be speaking with us. And also we have General Naeem Khalid, a former defense secretary, joining us from Islamabad. I'll start with you, Mr. Intizar. How do you see these, this two-day summit unfolding? Uh, do you have hopes for it having an actual positive effect in terms of how talks are going to go, how peace is going to be maneuvered? between these two? Well, thank you. Uh, but the two-day summit in, in Doha is, is, is very pleasing for the Afghan people. It generated a number of hopes for the Afghan people because the first ever summit happening between Taliban and the Afghan uh, opposition, opposition, the government uh, officials, it's really giving uh, a room for future constructive engagement between the Taliban in the uh, Afghan nation. It's called the intra-Afghan dialogue. It's going toward the very right direction because so far the, the, the uh, discussion we are observing uh, from Doha is very constructive. I mean, nobody is even using a harsh word. Uh, but at the same time, as you mentioned uh, in your uh, preamble, uh, the recent attack in Ghazni is very sickening. Uh, 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 though the Taliban leadership uh, declined that very cautiously, but uh, 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 injuring and killing over 100 people is, is not acceptable anymore. Because for the time being, as we are just heading toward a new phase of, of uh, peace communication and getting out of war uh, rhetoric, we mm -hmm. have to be very careful both in words and also in, 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 the, in the terms we're using toward the future communication. Also, we have to be stopping and halting uh, toward the, the, the bombing, uh, we cannot juggle two balls. We cannot play two games right. at the same time. We cannot claim our intention towards peace, and at the same time, we're just bombing each other. So that's re really not acceptable even for uh, ordinary Afghans and also for the position and opposition. And right. people around the world, and politicians around the group, all of them have condemned this heinous attack on Ghazni. But at the same time, we cannot stopped by right but it's it, whether it's one person dies or 14 die as this happened there are also pictures floating on social media of so many children who were injured because apparently when it took place at 8 p.m in the night there was a school nearby where kids were still in class now there is a lot of criticism on the pictures coming from various factions saying these are doctored photographs some are saying this these are pictures from syria some are saying they're from iraq and that there are, uh, uh, this is fake news being planted that so many children uh, were injured. There are about 179 reportedly injured, out of which 50 were children. What do you make of this kind of uh, information coming out? How can we determine uh, that this fake news is not disrupting a very critical peace process, Mr. Intizar? Well, three things. First, this is not a picture, but there could be thousands and, and hundreds more pictures. This is not the last and the first incident. There could be some more incidents. Mm -hmm. Also, there is a very confusing scenario that's happening in Afghanistan. As we claim, as the international community is claiming, and also the Afghan government in the United States by itself is claiming that it's not only Taliban in Afghanistan, but there are more than 20 more terrorist groups in Afghanistan. So everybody can do a, a dirty tricks. Uh, so that can that sabotage the, the entire peace process in the constructive dialogue that's happening right now. Right. That's why we have to be not like putting not putting all the eggs in one basket, and we can we, we may stop all the doors of communication. So uh, we should not be very much surprised because Afghanistan is is just like a bloodbath in that's happening at a daily basis. You may okay. remember something happened likely in Kabul, and, and there's also hundreds like injured so many people. Mm. Third, we have to confess that. That, uh, the analysts, the political analysts, like the media analysts, and also the media in the social media just made a so much destructive role in the Afghan war for the last so many years. Mm -hmm. The fake news is completely a possible scenario that's really triggering more uh, uh, oil in, in, into the war of Afghanistan. Right. So yes, that's a fake news as well, but also there is a possibility that a lot of people killed and injured. Also, the school kids are just injured in Ghazni. Mm -hmm. What do I, even that's a, if that's a kid, two, four, ten, hundred, that right. should be stopped and stopped immediately. Even though people from the Qatar and also some sympathizers of Taliban in Kabul, they are also like, like showing their uh, grievances on the things that are happening in, in, in Afghanistan uh, simultaneously okay. when Doha attack is, is continuing. Let me bring you in, um, General Naim, uh, in Islamabad, into this conversation here. 
who are those actors most likely uh, looking to disrupt peace being established between the Afghan government representatives who the Taliban insist are meeting on a personal capacity here with the Taliban? Thank you. Uh, I mean, the ideal statement is that uh, war is bad and talk is good. And I totally agree with my friend in Sadar that uh, this is a good omen that uh, the intra Afghan dialogue is going on. And you asked that who could be the detractors. I'll just come to that. This intra Afghan dialogue is going on uh, in a number of places, at a number of levels. We, we know that it happened twice, thrice in Moscow. Uh, huge uh, numbers, uh, they attended that. China is also supporting it. It also happened as a Lahore process uh, very recently in Pakistan and now in Doha. So this is good that uh, Afghans are talking to each other. So intra-Afghan dialogue is going on. Uh, that is one thing. Uh, the real politics, you know, whenever we say that talking and fighting at the same time, uh, in real politics, this happens always. I mean, you will, you can go to Middle East, you can go anywhere, and you will find that people talk and also they battle. Uh, so actually, uh, even now, even today, probably Afghan Taliban don't want to give this impression that while talking, they don't want to exhibit any weakness, uh, something of that. Okay. But uh, you asked that who who could be the people who are who could be doing all this? I uh, totally agree with my brother that there, there are so many entities now operating in Afghanistan in pursuit of their own interests. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me count some of them. Uh, you know, Afghan government is one entity. Um, uh, 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 these are gun runners, uh, narcotic barons. Uh, the, the local chieftains, uh, right. then Afghan Taliban, and okay. so many other uh, other. Roles. General, name hold that thought while we expand again a little later on who those ends could be. I want to bring to attention here and uh, get your comment, Mr. Intazar, on this when uh, the statement came in from uh, Gulbadin Hikmatyar, the uh, leader of Hizb Islami, that foreigners were trying to monopolize this peace process. What do you make of this statement when he comes in and gives this statement? Well, I heard him uh, yesterday, and that was not a very good statement made by, by Gulbuddin Hikmatyar. I think we have to be uh, prioritizing national interests instead of personal interests. Uh, who deny that uh, the uh, Afghan conflict has been energized or, or a momentum has been given by the uh, regional countries, international players, and at the same time, who is uh, who's claiming that no international intervention has been uh, in the Afghan peace. Uh, definitely there is a monopolization, a try behind the scene. But we have to be, uh, as, a, as a national leader, we have to be putting the right statement into the public so people can start believing on, on the things that's happening right now in Doha and elsewhere uh, in the region and also in the international community. So uh, I think that's not a good timing for such statements. And I think uh, such kind of uh, uh, talk or maybe rhetoric can, uh, can destroy, at least we can, can interrupt, if I say, uh, the, the, the momentum that has been already uh, created uh, in Afghanistan and elsewhere. So I'm not happy. Uh, in other analysts are not happy because it's not a good timing. We it's have not to be good careful timing. about the wording we're using. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Intizar Khadim, for giving us your time and insight. Going back to you, General Naim, all of the politics around the world in history have always been about what's going on behind the scenes here. Now, it's all great and nice when a peace process is taking place, but this is something that is not new. What is very disturbing is the growing number of people dying on attacks, whether they are children or adults, or whether it's Taliban behind or terrorist groups within Afghanistan, or the US-led, uh, uh, supported security forces of the Afghans. The question really is, how far can this go on, especially with the September deadline? Uh, pretty much Mike Popper, your Secretary of State, has said okay, this is going to be a, a expectation that the peace will be uh, reached by then. What do you think, what is your expectation? Is this a possible, reasonable expectation, September, as a deadline? Uh, you know, we must keep in mind that uh, one of the main stakeholders, that is the one Taliban, they have not yet agreed to this uh, September deadline. And I think... Uh, that is what uh, must be one of the uh, items on agenda, whatever is being talked in Doha. Uh, I, I would also like to, uh, you know, say one thing again. Uh, I, this is an ideal statement that Afghan-led, Afghan-owned peace process. But whatever is the situation in Afghanistan today, uh, there cannot be an entity 
or a group of uh, ent agreed entities who could actually lead the Afghan dialogue or own the Afghan dialogue. So I think this complaint that uh, this complaint that foreigners are uh, leading this dialogue or foreign uh, you know powers are leading this dialogue is probably a, a demand which is impracticable because for the time being, for quite some time, uh, it will have to be led by or let me say assisted by. Uh, foreign uh, powers and forces, but later on it will boil down to the one led and one on. But that time has not uh, uh, come as yet. I agree with you that as far as killing of any human being, uh, whichever side does it, is is abhorrable and should not be done. But uh, what, this is what uh, you okay. know real politics is. Once the uh, United States they pursue their interest, they don't this, see that what uh, comes General Naim, in the way. Sorry to uh, cut you short here. We're just This is my last question. We're running out of time here. But very quickly, there are, of course, regional actors who have vested interests in uh, the region, in Afghanistan. We're looking at escalations of tensions in the Middle East, uh, whether they are U.S., Iran, or what's happening in Syria. Afghanistan is also playing a very critical role in this global scenario. Now, if peace were to be achieved, do you think what is happening in its neighborhood could become a deterrent to this peace process itself? Uh, naturally, as you said yourself, and I totally agree with you, that all these things are very closely connected. Because uh, if what uh, the standoff between Iran and uh, U.S. and of course Arabs and Iran, it has got something to do with uh, the um, American, uh, you know, whatever is happening in Afghanistan and the dialogue and the situation of Pakistan. So all this thing is uh, very uh, tightly tied up. And I think the present visit of our, uh, the planned visit of our Prime Minister to America, 20th mm -hmm. onward, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, for that, uh, I think the world will have to wait. Okay. And uh, before that, I don't think that any big thing can happen either in Afghanistan mm -hmm. or in Middle East. Uh, right. I mean, you may be thinking that I'm making a big statement, but I'm convinced that this visit of Imran Khan to America is very important. They are going to ask us uh, some favors, and we must ask some. Um, we we must first see that whatever they are asking is whether it is in our interest or not, uh, and then we must also ask something in return. Let us see how it goes. Okay, General Naim, thank you so much for giving us your time and uh, right. on to the developing issues here within Afghanistan as the second day of the intra-Afghan Taliban peace talk is underway in Doha. But that's all the time we have talk about this. We will see you tomorrow with a new episode of News Wire. Till then, goodbye.